All righty. I think we're live. Hi, Mark. <laughs> What's up, Mike? <laughs> I uh, I want to start off just by uh, thanking you for uh, for engaging with me in the comments and, and kind of starting this off. And I want to respect your time, so we'll make this kind of quick. But uh, for my audience, would you would you mind telling them kind of what you're up to and uh, and what what you do? Sure. Yeah. And Mike quick isn't always what I'm good at. Just a heads up. My wife <laughs> says fine, I'm, fine. I'm like a chronic over explainer. Um, so yeah. So really quickly, my name is Mark Lutz. I am the lead and founding pastor of Lux Digital Church. Um, I was a pastor outside of Pittsburgh for 11 years, youth pastor for six years, discipleship pastor for five years, same church family. Um, got to be with that church from being in a school with a couple hundred people through a couple of building projects and about a thousand people um, on a weekend in a really small town in Western PA. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not big on, uh, on verbally giving out resume right in the beginning of something, but sometimes it helps people, especially in digital space to know that you're not a heretical psychopath. Um, whenever they hear that you actually did minister inside of the physical yeah. church and you're also not online just because you couldn't hack it in physical ministry. No, um, that's a big deal. Here. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, you're not just here because it didn't work out somewhere else. Um, no, totally. And so after 11 years of ministry there and kind of uh, in the process of working towards becoming the lead pastor of that church as my pastor there which is a church that my wife and I still attend on a regular basis. The lead pastor of that church is a, one of the board members of our board here at Lux. Um, we, uh, we decided that what God had called us to do, um, which for my personal life calling to help the big C church reach the post-millennial generations likely wasn't going to be capable of doing that um, faithfully inside of the church context that I was in. Nothing wrong with that church. Like I said, we attend it still absolutely love that church family. Um, but that led us to deciding to plant a church inside of uh, the online world of uh, digital and online gaming. Um, and so our ch church functions and exists pretty exclusively inside of Twitch and Discord at this point. Sure. Um, if you're a physical church pastor, what I've learned to say to help uh, wrap minds around that is Twitch is our sanctuary and Discord is every other part of our church building. Um, okay. So if you're wondering functionally what we do in those spaces, what you would do inside your sanctuary, we're doing on Twitch, what you would do in every other spot of your building, we're doing on Discord. So do, um, just to clarify, so do you have a, an in-person meeting at all that corresponds with that or is it just totally digital? Yeah, no, we do not have. So I'm sitting in what is the only physical footprint of Lux Digital Church, which is about a 17 by 30 foot long uh, 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 studio above my garage. Um, but no, we don't have uh, like when when we have services, we unapologetically and intentionally do not have anybody here physically. So okay. um our ministry has been going, our church has been alive now and around for two years. We celebrated two years last week. Um, you know, we have everybody from all across the United States, Canada, um, Venezuela, uh, Czech Republic. Our furthest out is Guam and around Sydney. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll dive right into it. Uh, that, that really does a good job of kind of like framing the differences. Um, my audience will know kind of where I'm, I'm, I'm sitting at when it comes to like online uh, church expressions and you know functions uh whether it's you know uh digitally like you're talking about or vr churches that that kind of thing or even just you know digital uh expressions of in-person churches as kind of like an extra service to be able to do um but um yeah um just respond to your comment um you had mentioned something at the top of yours where um said hey mike i, I typically don't respond to youtube stuff but i really appreciate you doing it um, but if you haven't engaged in online digital community, it may be hard to understand. That's actually something I've heard a lot. Um, and I was wondering if you could flesh that out. Like, what do you mean by uh, engaging in a digital church community? And what does that look like for someone? Uh, maybe for um, like um, someone who was attending an in-person church and is now looking at uh, digital expressions because of circumstance or distance or time or any of those kind of things. Or for non-Christians, what does it look like? uh for that engagement like what is it what is what does an engaged member at your church look like yeah no that's a really good question and i i think that this extends so my comment goes way beyond um digital expression of church i, I think the vast majority of what we are doing in digital space in terms of physical churches broadcast 
broadcasting their online services is a far cry from digital church, right? It doesn't even come close to reaching any sort of minimal ecclesiology. Um, we're if if you can call us gathering, it's very very it, it's a stretch in terms of of what we're seeing actually happen as a product of COVID. And and arguably there was a lot of churches that were online before COVID and were trying new and creative things. And I think there are some churches like Saddleback and a handful of others who have tried Life Church, who've tried, I think, genuinely creative things to create and foster digital community. But when I say that, I say that in terms of um it's not just uh like online church community but in terms of digital community period like what does it actually look like to be part of a digital community so there's people in my church for example that met the 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 best man in their wedding for the very first time at their wedding they had never met them in person before but they were invited to be the best man in their wedding because it was the closest person in their life it knew the deepest things they knew the deepest things about them they yeah had been there with them throughout the course of their relationship why because they game together every single night of the week for the most part for 10 and 12 years prior to this person getting married so despite the fact that they had never been physically together so when i talk about digital community what i talk about is this sort of life on life genuinely transformational deep 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 relationships with people that happen exclusively in digital space yeah. and this is absolutely abnormal for most so when i see people who comment and they're like ah this isn't this isn't a real thing or are you sure that this is legitimate um what my experience has been is typically these are people in the church world who their the the total experience that they've had with digital space um include social media uh, social media influencers, Facebook comments, perhaps perhaps YouTube comments, right? And so people have remained screen names and profile pictures at best. Uh, you know, at worst, they're sort of ambiguous, amorphic, amorphic uh, parts of a, a an endless digital ocean. And so they yeah. really are dehumanized and lose personhood. And um, when I'm talking about digital community, what we're, what I'm really talking about is something that is far more akin to what you would see happen at a local coffee shop or a local pub, um, a place where people are just coming and actively living their life together and sharing their life with one another. And this yes. is the type of thing that we're seeing happen at our church every single week, right? This isn't like a, this isn't an abnormal thing or like an anomaly for us. This is, this is just how my life, my church life functions, right? I, I have a small group every Monday night. My wife has a small group every Tuesday night. Um, uh, I know deeper things in terms of the confession that's happened in that group, in terms of the growth that's happened in that group than I have in almost any physical small group I've ever led. Yeah. And so these are people who I consider to be absolutely my closest friends, the people I confide in the most often right now, mm -hmm. um, and people who I am actively living my life alongside. And almost every single one of the people in my small group, specifically in my church, I, I, could I meet with them in person? I could. Some of them will I? Yes. But for the most part, a lot of them are people who I will not I will not meet physically until heaven, whatever mm. heaven looks like in terms of physicality. Yeah. Um, you'd also mentioned and just kind of working into that, I think this ties in nicely that uh, you don't think that God is working in people's lives because it's online, but he's working in people's lives regardless of it being online or in person. And I think uh, that's something that's often misunderstood. Um, from people who are anti-online church, uh, where it's like, um, because it's not in person, they just discount all the stuff that's happening online, as if God can't work in circumstances that can be, and, and I would make the distinction viewed through online connection as opposed to through online. Um, do you think there's anything specific ab about the online, um, I guess the best word would be environment, that... Uh, that God's using that way. And I, I hesitate to use the language, but like, like a Elijah's cloak where it was, it was something that was used to transfer power, like Jesus's clothes where it was power was transferred through it. You know, when we, when we look at objects, which the internet is made out of, um, I think people often don't have a good idea of what those things actually, what, what the internet actually is. Uh, it presents itself as a place uh, but it's made up of objects, so it's not a place the same way that, you know, um, Milwaukee's a place. But it's also not a thing the way, like, just, you know, a, um, a brick is. It's it's kind of both and. 
Uh, and I, I wonder uh, what your, what your thoughts are, and if we could flesh that out of like what you mean when God's, uh, if God's working through the internet, or is just is God working in people's lives, and we're just seeing it because we have the internet and the ability for that information to kind of proliferate. Mm. Uh, well, that question seems pretty multifaceted. Yeah. Um. So let's break down a couple of things, and and maybe I'll just break down why I think that we're beginning to see God move in digital space. Yeah. That, a, that's exactly kind of where I was trying to lead. Yeah, Sorry if it, I wasn't clear, but yeah, that yeah. that's perfect. Yeah. In a way that, um, that maybe we haven't historically seen. Um, I, I think one of the, one of the issues that we have is um, anybody virtually my age and older, so I'm 34, right. We have a, a hyper dualistic view of digital versus physical, um, the coming generations do not share that view, nor yeah. do they share that experience, right? They are intimately hybrid creatures. And truth be told, Mike, you and I are hybrid creatures as well, right? Mm -hmm. There's, you're not, we're not going to get off of this call and I'll be like, well, you know, Mike, who I talk to is not a real person to me because I only met with him over a Zoom call. Yeah. Um, so this space that you and I are choosing to meet in right now, this web address that's that's hosting us, right? This mm -hmm. place that we're getting an opportunity to engage in um, is a, a truly hybrid experience. I am physically sitting in my studio in Pittsburgh area. You're physically sitting in your office and in your study right somewhere in Canada. Yeah. And so we have hybrid realities, but we also have very digital realities. And what I find is, is that um, the church world specifically, but I, it, it's not really necessarily a church world issue. It's a generational issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, on the, on the micro scale, on the small scale, we understand that, right? Because um, my children's relationship with their grandparents um, isn't invalidated because they met with them on FaceTime this week. Can my kids meet with their grandparents in person? Absolutely, they can. We live 45 minutes from them. They see them frequently. But that doesn't mean that when they meet with Grammy on FaceTime, that Grammy, that doesn't count, that that part of the relationship ceases to exist. So mm -hmm. we we lead very hybrid lives um, already. And so we are all a blend of both digital and physical presence in in our physical and digital footprint both matter substantially to us. Yeah. And we've learned how to build relationships in both places. The problem becomes when we begin talking about digitally exclusive relationships, right? And yeah. when I say digital only, I know it's like people are like, blah, 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 right. They get all, well, they get all it's easy agitated. to take it too far on that. And I, I see a lot of people. Um, yeah. I, I see a lot of people um, kind of reject the, the online uh, any kind of online church work or expressions or or services, anything like that, out of principle, it's like no, it's not in person. It doesn't count. This is like the you know what's a real Christmas tree argument. It's like if it, if it's not a real Christmas tree, then how is it real Christmas? You know, and it's yeah. There's tons of different kind of uh, logical or, or or moral kind of things that you could go down to try and you know discuss that. It's like what what I've always tried to do is is um, really kind of nail down like what what are we doing theologically? Is that uh, is that right? Is there something more right? Is it wrong? Is there something more wrong? You know, that kind of thing. And I don't think that the online church, um, I don't think that it, it finds itself in, in like a, a deep pool of heresy, but I, I do think it's, it's a different pool than what everyone else has, um, uh, experienced over time. And that that's never really been articulated. Mm. And it's, it's one of those, like, we're, we're gaining ground here. People are getting saved. How do we, how do we find the theology that's doing this alongside it so that it can be, you know, proliferated without, you know, just saying, no, this is just how it's done now. And we have to forsake the other. Cause I think a lot of people on the anti-church side, they're like, Oh, that just means we're going to forsake gathering in person. And it really isn't, it's not even a both. And they're like two different kind of expressions now that we have this technology, you know? Yeah. I, you know, I think that uh, what, what is so interesting, Mike is, I hear those arguments and I always hear those arguments from people who have never had a healthy or even any understanding or experience of gathering in digital space. Um, if you were to talk to my church family, um, my church family would un unequivocally tell you that that their experience at Lux has not in any way, shape or form lacked gathering. Mm -hmm. um, they would actually largely tell you that they have had a 
greater and deeper experience with the gathering of the church through our church than they have ever had in their lives. And this is not just 20 year olds. This is up through 60 year olds. Yep. Um, and so this isn't exclusive. And so, uh, you know, my struggle with uh, uh, talking about the theology of, of this particular thing is that theology, oftentimes the discussion around it is, is really just man's attempt to put God in a box. Right. And so mm -hmm. as God moves, then it's like, well, we have to shift and change things because God no longer fits in our box. So let's make a new box to put God in over here so that we can wrap our minds around and understand what he's doing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I and I had the same exact issues. Right. So I think that one of the things that it has made our church unique in the space in terms of our ability as a digital expression to speak to physical church and physically minded people is that I was a physical church pastor. And I did think the digital expressions of the church were at best um, a bad idea and at worst heretical. Mm -hmm. And I thought that for a really long time. Um, in fact, you can go back and watch any of my service, any of my sermons back at newlifexn.org and, and probably twice a year, you'll see me preaching about a community. And I will tell you that God's plan A is the local church and God doesn't make plan B's. And that was, I mean, that was something that I was just known for. I was a micro church person well before I was a digital church person. Yeah. And so the process that God had to take me through and the Holy Spirit had to take me through to get us to plant locks um, was one that was deeply rooted in scripture. And what I found through that process was my understanding of what the church was had substantially less to do with what the Bible said and had a lot more to do with what I was comfortable with. Yeah. And realistically, all I really wanted to do was create a church experience that Mark would feel good in. And, uh, yeah. the, the version that we have created at Lux isn't my preferred version of church. I don't even think it's the best version. Mm -hmm. I I think that if you could get people to meet in person, you're better off. Like mm -hmm. I, I I genuinely believe that there are some there are some incredible opportunities with digital expressions of church, but there are also some very unique challenges that uh that there aren't super easy answers for. To be honest with you, inside of what we're doing right now, um, but that, but the next for the next generation that it doesn't matter, right? For the next generation, they are going to be engaged more in digital space and hybrid living than any generation that's come before them. The YouTube algorithm is learning who my daughters are as my daughters are learning who they are, right? At five and three years old, that they are learning and forming digital identity simultaneous to physical identity, which is very different than the way I did things because dial-up internet came into my life in middle school and high-speed internet came into my life in high school. Yeah. And so I intentionally created alternate versions of myself in digital space mm -hmm. and i had to relearn authenticity through digital space as i was not only exploring lux but the podcast that we started that end ended up ultimately springing lux into existence right and so but that isn't the case in the same capacity in the same caliber with the next generation as it is with people who are 32 33 and above so we talk um about doing church uh, not even just like uh, being members of a community together but actually doing you know, church as a, as a gathering in an online space. Um, where did you then go uh, from a position of acceptance uh, when it came to issues like communion or baptism, um, or I'd even throw weddings in there, even though it's not a sacrament, where these are kind of embodied things that need to be like, I've always had a problem with online church uh well through covid and stuff like that when it came to stuff like communion because i'm like no that's the the point is not to eat a meal at the same time it's to eat a meal together and mm -hmm. while i understand that it's a space we're not even if both of us had bread and both of us had you know wine or grape juice depending on your um uh, your beliefs on it uh we're not drinking that same cup that same bread uh, establishing that that gathered body is in fact the body of christ that is is gathered together for that and 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 using the sacrament to declare fidelity through that how does that work in an online space then if it's not just an, an exception that it's just pure symbolic then like I, i'd love it if you could speak to that sure well i mean first of all i believe the sacraments are symbolic so yeah i mean from a theological standpoint um i I, I, and what's interesting is that the way that for us taking the Lord's Supper together is actually one of the most moving and uniting things that our church does. And this isn't just something that I say. This is something that's echoed throughout 
our entire church, that joining into the Lord's Supper together has been one of the most unifying things that our church family has done together. We do it on the first week of every month. Mm -hmm. um, and I have I have bread and juice who are he with, here with me in the studio. We take time to repent. We go over the reason why. I mean, all of the things that you would do, right? And we ask the people from our church if they want to participate with us to gather common elements where they are and we partake together. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Uh, it's really interesting of like sharing the, like, I don't know. I don't know a single church that um, perhaps there is right. Because I'm not really involved in most mainline denominational systems. So perhaps there is churches that are still doing rip and dip and intention. Right. And they are actually sharing a common cup. I guess that would probably be true inside the Roman Catholic church, which I have said like theologically standing, like I understand why Roman Catholic church, perhaps the Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox churches aren't, okay with this because their theology around communion specifically makes it impossible for them to yeah. perform communion in a way that's on to wait to them that's honoring to god inside a digital space i don't mm -hmm. hold those restrictions myself because i'm not yeah. roman catholic or greek or Greek orthodox and so for me communion and baptism are an outward expression of an inward conviction mm -hmm. and, and uh, we have no problem partaking in that together despite the fact that I man, I'm not physically high fiving anybody. That being said, I don't know any churches in my experience that are even that are doing that, right? I don't know any of us that are sharing the same cup together, right? Uh, yeah, it's I, it's I, more the um, it's more the and I and I understand it's it's uh, in most circumstances not the same cup. It's not the same piece of bread that's you know being shared and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but we uh, we seem to be on this scale um, where there is kind of like a um, uh one side being pure symbolism and one side being re really an embodied like i i share this with these people uh because th these are like the the gathered saints on on one side and then when we gather online we're we're no longer sharing a meal that even if it is like prepackaged cups and we all get one we're all together doing it you know it's uh we're we're not even doing that on the online side where everyone's provide everyone's providing their own communion for their needs but doing it at the same time in, in fidelity with the rest of the people and using the online so that it can become that, if, if that makes sense. That That's what I've witnessed. And it's like, I, those seem to be different ends of that scale. You know, the, and I, and I wonder um, where, where do you go from, where do you go scripturally so that that makes sense to you? Cause like for, when I read those scriptures, I'm like, this is a shared meal, not a, a common meal which would be like shared, like uh, shared a shared experience as opposed to among people, as opposed to share an experience with people. So where, where would you go in scripture for that then? Yeah, well, I'm very cautious to extend what the Bible says to things it doesn't talk about. Mm. Um, and so one of the, I mean, some of the key complaints that people who have issue with digital expression of church, um, they come out of places where they pull scriptures that were never intended to talk about online space, let alone electricity, um, and they extend it to it, right? Which, yeah. in my experience, is a classic case of eisegesis rather than exegesis, right? Yeah. It's I'm taking my preconceived biases because this makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and you say you see them as two sides of the spectrum, and I, I literally don't, like, at all. Like, I, I the the idea of like hey on one side of the spectrum we have we're gathered together in a physical space where we're sharing a meal the, maybe maybe the two sides of the spectrum that i see is what our church and what the church for the most part does period and then uh maybe some theological persuasions that see the lord's supper as a form of not only sanctification but salvific in its work right yeah no i wouldn't i wouldn't go that far Okay, like I don't so think it's salvific, but yeah. I think that's, but I think that's, I think that's one. I, I think that is, if there's a, if there's a rolling scale, it's between symbolic Lord's Supper, right? That this is an outward expression of an inward conviction and that Lord's Supper itself by definition is salvific. If there's a yeah. theological scale that we're rating on, I think that's the scale that there is. I don't yeah. think it's the difference between we meet in person and we don't meet in person when we partake in the Lord's Supper because our church family doesn't see a difference between these two things. That, yeah. that we don't view it in any way, shape or form as our church is not gathered together, that we're not sharing in it together. 
And in that, I don't look at specific scriptures and say, well, these scriptures define online or digital space because they don't. The, mm-hmm. the the biblical writers were written with inspiration from the scriptures, right? Or were written by inspiration from the Holy Spirit, but they still wrote within the confines of the time and the space that they were in. Mm-hmm. And we can even see this through some of the stuff that we see through visions that maybe John was given to the book of Revelation, yep. that perhaps if he received those visions in 2023, he may have had more accurate words to describe some of the things that he was seeing. Yep. But when we see things like the book of Acts, where Luke is writing to us, and so a lot of our precedent for the theological framework comes from Acts chapter 2, which is where a lot of churches get their framework from, right? Who? Yep. Were, what are the things that the, that the believers devoted themselves to? Yeah. Right? And so what we say, what makes a church isn't whether or not you have a physical footprint. It isn't whether or not you gather at 1030 in the morning on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Um, What makes a church is a gathering or grouping of people with shared devotions and those devotions being the things that we see in Acts chapter two, devotion to the Lord's Supper, devotion to uh, or and I would I would extend to say baptism in the sacraments, right? Mm -hmm. Devotion to community, devotion to prayer and devotion to the apostles teaching. Yeah. And so when it came down to what we thought, what what is the biblical basis for digital church? I looked and I said, okay, and, and keep in mind, Mike, I wasn't a digital native in this way. It was through a podcast that I started that I began discipling and ministering to people through a Discord server that I realized that I was seeing more life change happen in digital space than I was at the church that I'd been serving at that point for nine or 10 years. Yep. And so- I was like, okay, life transformation is happening here. Discipleship is happening here. And, but this can't be a church. Yeah. And then as I, as I went through the scriptures and especially this section in Acts chapter two, I realized that the church wasn't defined by the physical building for these people. It was defined by these things that they shared in common, these devotions that they shared in common. And I was experiencing stuff in digital space that said, there's actually nothing preventing us from devoting to these same things. Mm Mm-hmm. And doing that in digital space. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't come with unique challenges, and we can talk about those because there are unique challenges associated well, with it. Yeah, I know, and I, and I want to respect your time too. Like uh, we're we've got just about out on the recording here, um, but um, I, I guess that really boils down to it, and that really does do a good e- example of explaining it. So I, I want to say thank you because it it really does um, kind of show that that um, that there is kind of a redefining of, of gathering but also that there there is an absence from scripture. And so what we have to do if we're going to be anti-online church is demonstrate that from the scriptures, which I, I do think is going to be a challenge because they don't, for the same reason that you couldn't find examples to do it online from scriptures, because they, it, it equally does not speak of that kind of thing. So we have to take those Christian principles that we have from a previous history of in-person stuff online with us. And that, that was one of the things that I, I, I witnessed at all all levels kind of, of online church uh, expressions and engagements and practice is that this this has never been, I, I don't think, a, a matter of uh, Christians acting in unchristian ways online. What it is, is that the church really acting in one of its truest expressions of like a global church. Uh, and I talk about this in my book where um, I think it'll be the death of denominations because uh, eventually you know, you, you can just listen, you you can gain teaching from a pastor because he's a pastor, not because he goes to your denomination, because you have the online connections. What I think and what I caution a lot of my audience about is that it, you can get to places where it really is problematic to kind of have both or not, not both. Um, it, it can be problematic to just be online because of the scripture speaking uh, about things like, and, and baptism would probably be the best example, because it like that has to happen with water. When do we turn baptism into just symbolic then? Or or does it always have to happen in water? And if it's water, that's where the church should be gathered to witness it, uh, like that that kind of stuff. But there's also examples of, you know, people getting baptized where there's no church present. So it's, it's yeah, it's it's kind of like this, this weird kind of middle ground. And uh, Everyone who's more theologically minded, uh, I I find, tends to just like like handle this with kid gloves and say, no, we're not touching that. It's like, no, this is important to engage with because you're 100% right. There's whole generations of people who are growing up in this reality and a church that's just refusing to talk to them about it. And where where 
where the line would be at all. It's it's just it's it's quite dangerous, I think. So I, I really appreciate yeah. your your perspective on it. So yeah, it looks let like me unpack. Can I can I unpack the baptism bit? Just no, sure. Because, we we got about cause... five minutes left. I hope it doesn't cut you off. But yeah, no, please. Okay. okay, so just really quickly, let me unpack the baptism bit. So I do. We we practice baptism at our church, and we see that as being something that needs to be happening physically. And so we do it one of three ways. Either on a local pastor that we partner with to baptize you, you film it and we share it with our church family. Mm -hmm. um, you find a believer in your in your life that will baptize you, and then we share it with our church family. Or you find people who aren't believers who are willing to baptize you, which we've had the case and have anybody who they knew who was a believer. And then um, I actually come over on a Zoom call with them. We pronounce father son and holy spirit it's, we've done this with uh, someone in a, a river in oregon we've done this with someone in their bathtub in missouri um and so we're seeing that sort of thing take place and so i agree with you in that um and but i once again i don't see the polarized uh dualistic view of physical versus digital i see a, a beautiful and endless merging and seeming and i think this is one of the things yep. the church really needs to challenge is their dualistic view of digital versus physical because the generations that are coming simply do do not see it that way. Why though, and this this might be the the kind of final thing we, we talk about. Why does baptism still have to be done with water if it does if the communion meal doesn't have to be a shared meal though? Where where do you do, draw that line from scripture? Uh because like if we're already making it symbolic in the sense that I, I can provide my own uh elements for the Eucharist, why can't I not provide my own waters for the baptism? as long as I'm in community or is, is that your position where as long as you're on the zoom call and I'm in the bathtub, just dunk. And then that's it. Is, is, is that valid? Do you think? A, yeah, I do think it's valid. Um, um, because I think that baptism is a public declaration of faith. And once again, an, an outward expression of an inward conviction. I think yep. that we have to follow in line with what not only Jesus set down, but also the church has set down for 2000 years. And I want to come back to that because I don't think that bapt that communion isn't a shared meal. And I don't think that we're not sharing a meal. So okay. I understand you're looking at it and you're saying you're not sharing a meal. I'm looking at it and I'm telling you we are sharing a meal. Uh, I, yeah. I understand that you're saying because it's happening online, it's not a shared meal. And I'm telling you from our perspective in, in everything that I've experienced, I don't see any reason why that it isn't, nor do I see any reason why there's validity behind that. Okay. And so, uh, and so I, I, we don't view it as us departing from, um, what the church has done for 2000 years. We see us celebrating what the church has done for 2000 years and continuing in that rich and beautiful tradition that was set down by Jesus and upheld by the church for the last 2000 years as a part of what we're doing at Lux every single month. And mm -hmm. so for us, baptism being physical and going underwater is a mimicking of what Jesus told us to do. And so I, I have friends who aren't there. I have friends who, you know, Theologically, they're okay with virtual baptism in some capacity. I have friends who lead VR churches who they're comfortable with that. I'm not. Like, I personally, and I'm not saying that they're wrong or that I'm right. I'm just saying I personally am not there when it comes to, and the same reason that I don't do infant baptism at our church, and we will never do infant baptism at our church, the same reason that to the best of our ability, we do full dunking and we don't do sprinkling. And um, it's because I see that that's what has been exhibited in the scriptures. And that's what the church has sought to live out for, for the history of the church. And so those are the things that are primary and important for us to carry forward as part of Lux Digital as well. That um, and so, yeah, we do see that Katie, when she says, I want to be baptized and her husband, Levi, draws a bath and my wife and I get on a call with her and we say, we baptize you in the name of the father, the son and the Holy spirit. And Katie gets dunked in the tub by her husband and pulled up and we pray over her. And then we share that with our entire church family. And that's Katie's public proclamation of faith to her yeah. church, her faith community. Yeah. We absolutely see that as a legitimate baptism. That, that does a great job of, of explaining. I really thank you for kind of sharing that. Um, are Katie and her husband members of your church or are these kind of fictional people? No, that's, that's, no, no, that's, no Katie and Levi have been part of our church since launch team. Um, their son, Weston, I, I was on the phone with Katie and Levi yesterday working through boundaries with their family. And so, no, uh, that's I've awesome. Been, I've been part of Katie and Levi's life since the day, the day that Weston was born. Um, Levi and I were on the phone together while Katie was in the hospital moments before she was going into labor and Weston was born. We've been part, their, their son was born about the same time as my youngest daughter. Yep. Um, you know, Katie came to faith over a phone call at her house in Missouri while I was in my backyard 
in Pennsylvania where she confessed faith and gave her life over to Jesus. We've walked with them through leaving our church and coming back to our church, leaving our team and rejoining our team. Um, we intimate. So like when I talk about digital community, Mike, this oh. is the type of thing that I'm talking about. Like this isn't just a, uh, yeah, I know them online. If they, they've liked some things yeah. that I've done. Yeah. This it's is, there, there is a point of entry. Authentic. It's not just connection. Yeah, like no, this is deep, authentic. Like they called me because they said, Mark, you've been our pastor and you've been with us through every step of working through setting boundaries with our families and protection of our son. Yeah. We need your help here with this. So yeah. so uh, it's about to shut us off here. Less than one minute. Um, I just want to thank you for your perspective. This, this has actually been really helpful um, for, for my understanding of it, my kind of study in, in the online church space. And it really does kind of clarify because I think a lot of times it, it really does turn into just like quippy comments. And I, I really appreciate you reaching out that way and kind of honoring this time and, and being able to kind of really flesh this stuff out because it, it simply just doesn't happen enough. So um, yeah, I want to say thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for having me. Appreciate no it. No problem. Uh, we'll uh, hopefully this isn't the last time we, uh, we kind of connect on stuff and uh, and yeah, I, uh, I uh, will be praying for your church and, and yeah, it's uh, it's been a great call. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you. Have a good one. Take care.